Finally, we are back with another video. So it's been about two weeks since I last uploaded, and I just wanted to quickly explain why that is before we get into the video. So the video that you're about to watch, I actually recorded around 10 days ago. And then unfortunately, when I went to release the video, my laptop broke, which also happened to be on the day when I was going on holiday. So I had to wait until I got back from holiday to buy a new laptop, re-edit the video, and then release it. So all of the information within the video that you're hopefully about to watch is still relevant. Uh, my opinion hasn't changed on any of it, but I do understand that it has been a little while since their earnings report, and you may have already seen some analyses on that, or you may have just made your own analysis on the earnings report, in which case, just feel free to skip forward to the valuation if that's all you're interested in. I'll make sure to include a sort of timestamp so that you can just skip to the relevant parts for you. So that's why it's been a little while since I last uploaded a video. And during that time, I noticed that there had been a few people that had unsubscribed to the channel. And honestly, I have no issues with that at all, right? So I understand that people subscribe to the channel to watch content. And if I'm not releasing content, then what's the point in being subscribed? I completely get it. Um, but hopefully now I will return to making more frequent videos. Um, so all should be good. Anyway, that's enough rambling for now. Let's get into the actual video. What's going on guys and welcome back to another video. So Context Logic or Wish just reported their Q2 2021 earnings and wow, it's down over 26% in the pre-market at $6.93. Now this is a company that only IPO'd in December 2020 and it IPO'd at $24 per share, right? And it actually closed on that day at $20 per share as we can see here. And ever since then, it's been on a bit of a wild ride. So it actually rose all the way up to, I think it was $31 a share, right? So that was a 50% increase. And then ever since then, we've just been on a complete downtrend and it's now over, well, it's 70% down. And that was before the pre-market drop. So actually closer to 80% down um, from its all-time highs, which is absolutely crazy. So we're going to go through their earnings report and see why it has dropped so much and whether this is actually a buying opportunity and what my plan is with the stock going forward. So I'm not currently a shareholder, but uh, following the drop, I figured let me take a look and see whether there's actually some value there. So let's get into it. But just before we look into the earnings report, right? Now, this is a stock where when you look at some of their key ratios and their key statistics, it actually looks quite cheap or quite undervalued, right? So $9.41 is the price where it closed at yesterday before their earnings. So that gave them a market cap of $5.8 billion. Once we take into account the new drop, that market cap's going to be somewhere around $4.5 billion, and it's gonna give them an enterprise value of around $2.7 billion, right? If we look, look across to their financials, their trailing 12 months revenue is $2.9 billion. So that right there gives them an enterprise value to revenue of one, which seems really low on the face of it, but we'll dig into why it's so low later on when we look at their earnings report. But then if we look at some of their other key statistics as well, 52 week low was $7.52. Now we've just broken that, right? So it's $6.93. And again, when the market opens, I'll be interested to see where this goes. Are we going to see a load of buyers coming in at this price or is it going to continue to fall? And you know, if it starts to fall much lower than this, this could just be in free fall. So definitely one to look out for at the open. But if you just look at their 50 day moving average, 10.73, 200 day moving average of 14.84, we are well below those averages. So at this point, we've broken any sort of resistance lines or support lines rather, and we could definitely see the stock going further down. But anyway, let's look into the earnings report and find out what's really going on. So I'll give you the good news first, right? And to be perfectly honest, there's not an awful lot of good news within this earnings report, which is why the stock is down 27% in the pre-market. But what is good about this company is their balance sheet. So they've got cash and cash equivalents of $1.4 billion, multiple securities of $168 million, Put the two together because effectively multiple securities could be sold very quickly um think bonds or something like that so then we've got a sort of total cash balance of 1.55 billion dollars now remember that the market cap is around 4.5 billion dollars so straight away you're getting 33 percent in cash so that's very good and then other than that they don't have too much going on here right so they've got right of use assets of 32 million dollars so this is not a very capital intensive business at all which is very good as well um, they're not going to need lots of lots of cash to grow or they shouldn't if they can manage to stay sort of cash flow positive unfortunately we'll see that that's not the case anyway we're looking over to current liabilities they've got 858 million dollars of current liabilities that gives them a current ratio when we look at their total current assets of 1.7 billion dollars of two so that's very good balance sheet is very good and then like i say they don't have many long-term liabilities they've got the Lease liabilities for the right of use assets up here of $31 million. And other than that, that's pretty much it. 
So their balance sheet is really good, right? They've got more than enough cash that they could pay off all of their liabilities and they would still have plenty of cash left over. So that is the big positive for this company. Now let's move on to the income statement. So the income statement is where it starts to get really quite ugly, right? So for the three months ended June 30th, 2021, they achieved revenues of $656 million. Compare that to a year ago when they achieved revenues of $701 million. So we've seen a decline in their revenues, which is never good. Part of that is because they had such a good quarter a year ago from now, and that was obviously driven by the pandemic. But it's not an excuse that they haven't been able to grow their revenues. Not only that, though, right, it doesn't just stop there. We look at their cost of revenues, $272 million. Compare that with $208 million. So their cost of revenues have increased. Their revenues themselves have actually decreased. So we've got margin contraction there, which means they're becoming less and less profitable as they're growing. And actually, they're not even growing. They're just becoming less and less profitable as time goes on. So that is like a big red flag. We don't want to see that, right? And then again, for their total operating expenses, we've got $498 million compared with $481 million. So their operating expenses, again, have increased despite the fact that their revenues have decreased. So they're selling more and yet their operating expenses are actually increasing. So again, that's not good to see as well. So that takes us to a net loss of $111 million for the quarter compared with $11 million for the quarter a year ago, right? So when they actually posted these results back in 2020, everybody was saying that Wish was on the verge of becoming profitable once again. We can see that that's not the case and actually they've gone in reverse. So that is a big red flag and people aren't happy about that, which is why we've seen the massive drop in their pre-market. It's not just that though, it's also what management have actually come out and said. Effectively, management have come out and said that the quarter hasn't been what they were hoping it was going to be and now they're actually expecting that the next few quarters as well are going to be pretty much just as bad. Um, but we'll get into what management have actually said shortly. But effectively, the outlook for this company is not very good. And then when we look at cash flows, right, so free cash flow is negative $205 million for the quarter. Compare that with a year ago when they had free cash flows of $625 million. That's not very good at all. If we look on a six months basis, right, we've got free cash outflows of $559 million compared with free cash flow or inflow of $496 million. So that's obviously not very good at all. They're burning through around $600 million in cash um, every six months. So we're looking at possibly $1.2 billion of cash outflow um, across the whole year, which is definitely not very good at all. So that cash balance that we see of around $1.5 billion, that's not looking as good as it was initially when we're considering that this could be as high as $1.2 billion for the year or probably slightly less than that, $1.1 billion for the year. Um, that $1.5 billion of cash that we currently hold is soon going to be dwindled away. And then people are going to be thinking, well, we need to raise cash. So how are we going to do that, right? We're either going to sort of issue new shares and dilute the current shareholders, or we're going to raise debt. And both of those things are going to hurt earnings per share, or even in this case, loss per share. Um, so that's not very good at all. But it's not just the financial results, which is starting to scare off investors, right? It's actually what was said in the letter to shareholders and the outlook for the company. So they actually said here that total revenue declined 6% year over year, which we saw. Strong year over year growth in logistics revenue of 126% was offset by a 29% year over year decline in marketplace revenue. Overall, we expected user retention to improve now that we have more reliable logistics, but instead retention declined. So they said that actually they've invested in their logistics. Their platform is actually now better than it was before. And despite this, uh, retention, user retention has actually declined. So that is a big red flag straight away. Despite the fact that they've invested in the business, people still aren't using the platform. That's not a good sign. Management then go on to say that during Q2 2020, we benefited from a significant increase in mobile usage and less competition from physical retail as a result of stay-at-home mandates that continue throughout much of the year. So last year was actually a perfect set of circumstances for Wish, right? So people had to stay at home, right, because of the stay-at-home mandates. And that meant that they couldn't visit physical stores, right? So more people were shopping on their platform through that. But also because people were at home and bored, people were using their mobile phones more and therefore they were stumbling across Wish as well. And yet, despite all of that, they still couldn't be profitable in the year prior. So that's a big red flag, right? So under the perfect circumstances for the business, they're still not profitable. Now, you have to start to question both management's ex execution but also the sort of business strategy that they're employing, right? So you have to really question whether 
they can ever become profitable if in a perfect set of circumstances, they're unable to be profitable. And when I say that, right, it's not even like they were almost profitable. So in 2019, they had a net loss of $129 million. In 2020, that net loss expanded all the way to $745 million, despite the fact that their revenues increased massively. So that is really a massive red flag. And actually, when we see where the expenses were, they're largely in sales, general and administrative. So these expenses aren't necessarily expenses which are being incurred to push growth in the business. They're just pretty much standard expenses in order to operate the business. So to have a net loss of $745 million in a year where the circumstances suggest that you should be doing very well is really quite worrying. And then in addition to that, right, they said that globally they saw a 13% reduction in app installs and a 15% reduction in average time spent on their platform in Q2 2021 compared to Q1 2021. So this is quite astonishing, right? This isn't a comparison between Q2 2021 and Q2 2020, in which case everybody was at home. And so of course they had more installs, of course more people were spending time on their phones. No, this is a comparison quarter over quarter, right? And they saw a 13% reduction and a 15% reduction in app installs and average time spent on their platform respectively. And that's quarter over quarter. So if you imagine that they continue on that decline, the revenues of this business are going to go down the pan. They are going to be terrible. So that is not a good sign of the business at all. And at this point, I'm really starting to doubt where the business is going in the future. And then just a couple of bits on their outlook, right? So management have said that we do not believe our Q2 performance is reflective of the strength in our platform and what the company can achieve. The actions we are taking to improve execution and user experience are expected to strengthen Wish's operating performance. We do not expect these new initiatives to contribute meaningfully to positive year over year results before the second half of 2022. So we're going to have to wait a whole year from now for the actions that management are putting in place um, for us to actually reap the rewards of those. And that's only if management are able to execute on those plans, right? So it doesn't really look very good for the company. And that sort of suggests that for the next couple of quarters, they're going to probably put in really poor results as well which again means that we could see some downward um, sort of pressure on that share price, which wouldn't be good either. And just off the back of that, they said that at this time, we will not be providing our usual quarterly revenue outlook as we are focused squarely on execution and efficient expense management. So effectively what they're saying is that they're not really concerned about what their revenues are going to be for the next couple of quarters. What they really want to rein in is sort of reduce their expenses and try to become more profitable, or at least less loss making, right? Which I don't think is a bad strategy because you can continue to just absolutely throw everything at growing your revenues, which is, it looks to be sort of what they've done sort of the last couple of years or so. But if your losses are just widening every single time and we're getting even margin contraction, it's, there's no point. There's no point in earning revenues when actually for every revenue, sort of dollar of revenue you earn, you're losing $1.50, right? And that's sort of the position that this company is in. And so they really need to rein in those costs to try and become profitable. And then finally, management here have said that to provide some context, quarter to date total revenue through July 2021 was down approximately 40% compared with the prior quarter. What marketplace revenue was down approximately 55% compared to the same period. So revenues are just not looking good, profitability is not looking very good, the results are not looking very good, things are not really looking very good, right? With that being said, the share price has fallen massively, right? So it IPO'd at $24, we're now sitting at around $6. And whenever we see a company's share price deteriorate in this way, right, so it's down 75% over the past six months, there's always the opportunity or the possibility that there's an opportunity and there's some value there, right? So we need to consider whether this is actually just a complete overreaction by Wall Street and the wider market. And actually, is there a little bit of value there, despite the fact that management and the company aren't necessarily executing as well as they should be. So what I've done is I've input some assumptions into my discounted cash flow and earnings multiple model to try and determine what I think a fair value for this company is. Now, for one to five year revenue growth, I've gone with 10%. Now, that might seem quite conservative to some, but you have to remember that actually they just experienced a quarter where revenue growth was uh, negative. They saw a negative 6% in their revenues. And so I think that over the course of five years, one to five year revenue growth is probably about fair. If we actually look to their six months for the current year, so for 2021, they've posted revenues of $1.4 billion. And again, management have already said that revenues are actually starting to decline a little bit. Um, so I've got $2.7 billion. If we can sort of multiply that by two, get around $2.85 billion. 
I think that's probably about fair, right? So $2.7 billion for 2021 is probably reasonable. Now, management haven't actually provided us any guidance on that, but just judging by sort of the results that they've put in so far, I think that $2.7 billion is probably a little bit bullish, if anything, right? They're probably going to fall somewhere closer to what they posted um, in 2020, around $2.5 billion. Anyway, it's not really the point. We don't need to focus on one year. Over the course of five years, I think that it's reasonable, right, that management will be able to achieve revenue growth of 10%. Six to 10 year revenue growth, we've gone with 8%. Again, just to show that sort of slowing down in revenue um, or revenue growth. But ultimately, I don't think that these are too conservative. I also don't think that they're too bullish. I think they're probably about fair for this kind of business. For gross margins, right, over the last five years, the average has been 76%. If we actually look to 2020, their gross margins were only 63%. So this is what we was talking about with their margin contraction. As their revenues are getting larger, their gross margins are actually declining, which is not a good sign at all. Um, and actually we've seen that in the quarters one and two of 2021, gross margins have actually been somewhere closer to around 55%. So the gross margins aren't looking very good. However, if management are able to sort of rein in those costs, like, like they're saying that they're going to, Gross margins of 76% in the long term, it's probably a fair assumption. Um, so that's what I've applied to my forecast going forward. Again, I think that to be honest, for 2021 and 2022, I'm not sure that they're going to hit that. But for the sake of the discounted cash flow model and the earnings multiple model, it's not going to make a absolutely massive difference, right? So over the course of sort of a 10 year period, which is what we're looking into, it's not too outrageous to say 76%. Now, operating expenses as a percentage of revenue, the average of the last five years was 91%. Now, if I was to apply 91% going forward for the next five years or for the next 10 years, the company is never going to be profitable according to those projections. What I have done is I've said that 2021, if they can achieve operating expenses as a percentage of revenue of 85%, again, probably slightly too high judging by the latest quarter, but then if they can drop that by 5%, year over year, so 5% as a percentage of revenue, um, all the way to 55% in 2027, at which point it should stabilise. Um, that's sort of the projection that I've used in my forecast. Now, trying to project for a company that is not currently profitable and is going through a lot of changes is quite difficult. But what we're trying to do with this, we're not trying to get it perfect, but what we're trying to do is put a finger in the air and just try and find out what is a rough price, right, that we might be willing to pay for this company. And is it reasonable, right? Not is it possible, but is it probable that the company can execute on the numbers that we're putting forward? So we need to consider whether these appear reasonable to us and whether we believe in management's plan. Right, so that's something to bear in mind as well. The truth is, right, is that you can put in absolutely any assumptions that you want and you can make these really, really complicated models. But as the saying goes, garbage in equals garbage out. And you should never rely 100% on the models that you are creating, especially for a growth company. Not only that, you could also just choose to value the company on a more simple basis, like a price to sales, right? So you sort of project what their sales are going to be in five years time, which shouldn't be that difficult. Um, or it should be a little bit easier than trying to predict their sort of full income statement um, and then apply a price to sales ratio to that. But again, there's, you know, there's a number of ways in which you can buy your business. This is just one of them. Now for free cash flow as a percentage of revenue, I've said that in the future, I'm expecting that to normalize at around 9%, right? And that's based on some of their competitors, some of their historical results, and also what analysts are expecting for the business, right? But if we actually look to 2017, they achieved free cash flow of 12% of revenue. Um, but ever since then, it's been negative. For 2021, though, I've said that we're expecting free cash outflow around $850 million. And we can see that for the six months, they've actually blown through $559 million. So that number there could be a little bit low. Um, but for 2022, I've also said that $400 million in free cash outflow before finally turning free cash flow positive by 2023. And then from there onwards, it's just 9% of revenue. So we do start to see quite a nice uptick. But again, we're not really expecting that until 2023, 2024, when the business finally may, according to these projections anyway, become profitable. And then the terminal growth rate I've used is 2% and a weighted average cost of capital, which has been calculated in here, of just under 12% we get an average estimated intrinsic value of around $6, right? So according to the DCF, it's worth around $5.72.
And if we look at the earnings multiple model, if we apply a P ratio in 10 years time of 15, which is probably, you know, about right for a company that's only growing revenues at 8% per year, according to our model, then we get an average estimated intrinsic value of $6.08. So it's still slightly overvalued if you believe that the inputs in you know, my model are fair, which you may not agree with. You may think that the company is going to grow at a higher rate than that. And that's fair enough, but I do think that management have a big job on their hands with this one, right? And I'm not sure that this is a company that I would particularly want to be involved in. If you're trading this company, then there's definitely some potential for sort of a short-term uplift, I think, according to the charts. Um, but it's not something that I would be particularly too concerned with um, in terms of investing in. If it fell to, for example, $5, then maybe I would get involved and just have a bit of a speculative investment on uh, within my portfolio. Um, but certainly at $6.74, which it's currently trading at, um, I don't think it's even worth that. Um, so yeah, that is all for now, guys. Apologies if the video has been slightly longer than anticipated, um, but if you've made it this far, thank you very much. And until next time, thank you.